In the northern part of the kingdom west, this is where Lion's Gate lies. Here the bird sings outside his nest as he greets the morning sunrise. In Lion's Gate, neath the tall fir trees, on your face feel the ocean breeze. Feel the magic that's in the air in Lion's Gate, the fair. Excellency. Thank you. Welcome to another Lion's Den. Tonight, I see I'm not the only landed baron on. Welcome, Clovis. I am Baron Kinnerick, and I haven't made any garb unless you count fighting garrisons. Glad I made a few, but I can sew a tent up really well. Tonight, though, we have an expert. <gasps> <laughs> Mistress Desiree Aurelia Charel Strella uh, is a rare gift in these dark times, a person of true positivity, acceptance, and upliftment. Her unique blend of grounded wisdom and internal joy has helped so many of us. Whether it be at events or event planning, Eric side or Eric party, Mistress Desiree always seems to be in the thick of things, usually helping, occasionally mischief making. She also has a passion and talent for costuming and is well known for her tailoring. Something so completely mysterious to the early period folks among us. She received her Jean de Lyon in 2010 for costuming. In our kingdom, this is recognition for excellence in arts and science. She has become a real supporter and teacher in Thierry of later period tailoring and patterning. Apart from her ANS work, she remains, as she has always been, a truly dedicated person to helping support our royalty, as well as event steward and just about every aspect of service there is. Mistress Desiree, we are so glad you could join us tonight and share your passion and knowledge with us. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I really appreciate that. Um, I want to, I'm, I'm a pelican, service is, is my wonk. Um, I do do a lot of costuming and I have taught this class before, but I am by no means the only ex or close to an expert. Um, what I'm hoping to do tonight is to be able to introduce some options, give you some knowledge and some overviews and a little, some tools to help you establish some of your first garb to come to the SCA. Uh, I do have a link obviously set up with all the different information. In the past, when I've done this in person, I am able to hold up different items and say, here, look, this is this. So instead, what I've done is I've gone all over the internet and I've blatantly stolen images and put down links and different things that will enable you to then start your own research a little bit. By giving you these links in this different research, I. I by no means want you to think that we expect you to have the perfect, most period walk out of a portrait garb. The only thing we ask is that you make an attempt at a pre 1600s outfit of any kind. So with that in mind, I'm going to share my screen because I do have my, what, disabled participant screen sharing. Um, can you maybe let me share my screen, please, so that I can show my handout a little bit. It's got some things that I'd like to refer to. There we are. Now, bear with me because technology. Here we are. Um, this is just on a word pad, but you get the idea and we'll be able to go through with it. The reason I selected this picture right off the top is because this is a photograph of me many years ago with a magical llama, obviously. The idea behind the SCA and what I enjoy is that it should be fun. And please, please don't get so tied up in things that you are paralyzed and you don't want to do the thing it's supposed to be fun you're supposed to enjoy it and you should do it always with a little bit of a sense of humor and joy in your heart um, this is by far one of my favorite pictures of myself with this lovely llama so we'll get we'll get back to that in a little bit and whatnot um, so I'm not going to read this to you verbatim. That's just a little bit nutty and uh, won't make any sense because you have the document when we 
talk about pre 1600 in the past we've usually done 600 to 600 but the sta encompasses that which is previous to 600. when i was looking at it trying to trying to figure out where to start and where to focus on this vast time period i came across 1066 which of course is the normans invading um it changes history a little bit on the continent and things like that because previous to 1066 while there's lots of things going on i have a little blurb about it here not a lot is going on in europe that is super now please if you're a european early period buff i apologize but a lot of really creative interesting things um going on right now are um in jerusalem and in the Holy Lands, and Mohammed is preaching, and um, the beautiful um, illuminated, I can't remember what it's called, the Irish did a beautiful illuminated text at this time, and the Gregorian chants are starting, and we're only just starting Christianity, and we're only getting super hot things in Europe going on. So with that in mind, pre-1066, the garb, and this is a really general statement, please don't come after me, the garb is fairly similar. It's fairly loose fitting. Um, there are absolutely regional differences with trims and embroidery and cuts and colors, but they're really not too dissimilar one country to the next. For example, oh, hang on, my mouse is being weird. For example, this fellow right here, can you guys see my mouse if I move it on my screen? Yes. Okay. This fellow here with his little interesting, this is a, this is a Russian guy whereas and obviously i would assume she's russian but it's not too dissimilar from this lady over here which is hanging out with all her norse friends or things like that so they're not too dissimilar um if we look at the idea that we just want to get you dressed to get you into an event this is some of my recommendation i like the after 1066 right in there this particular dress is the first dress I ever made. It was in, featured in the Known World Handbook with a pattern and very simple instructions. Um, one of the reasons I love putting this gown, I lend it out to people if they are newcomers, is with all the sleeves and with the full skirt, it feels very princessy without being trussed up in a corset or wearing a heavy headgear or having um, a bum roll and all the different cartridge pleating going on. It's a very accessible, very comfortable way to get yourself into the SCA. So I have included here um, a few things as well. After this, when we get into later into the 14th century, things start to change. Bye. Oh, <laughs> you start to see um, distinct clothing changes from country to country, and you start seeing distinct regional changes as well. That being said, please do not think now that you've seen a portrait from 1415, for example, and therefore everybody in the, in the 15th century is dressing like that. Things change really quickly. As an example of that, I put in a portrait of our beautiful Henan, and I made this dress, by the way, because how much more princessy can you get? Like, come on, it's fantastic. Um, but I found out this afternoon, actually, Elvina mentioned that it was only really around for 20 years or so. So you're only talking about one generation wearing that beautiful, iconic princess hat. But if you go into any grade school and ask them what a princess wears, it's a hat with a veil, because why wouldn't it be? So keep that in mind when you're doing some of your research. The other thing that's really interesting when we hit the 14th century is um, we're starting to get cultures meeting one another. We're starting to get some more travel and we're starting to get some trade routes. So right in here is where Venice is starting to become a trader with um, Constantinople. So you've got all sorts of stuff. I wanted to put a note in here because I'm going to talk about several different countries, but I'm not going to touch on China. And I'm, I'm sorry, because there's people that are better at it, as is evidenced on this call, than I ever am. I know nothing about the Asian, the South Asian, is it South Asia? 
I know nothing about it. I don't even know what to call it. So I am not going to address it, but it is absolutely there and there's absolutely resources. So I just wanted to be clear that you can do it, but I can't help you. When you're looking into doing some of your garb, I've put in a couple of general guidelines. Um, if you've come into the SCA and you know exactly what you want to do, you know, I want to be a, a 15th century sailor or I would like to be on Leif Erikson's ship heading to Newfoundland. Wonderful, but it's something you can think about. Um, you need to consider what your budget is because when you're working with our natural fabrics and things like that, budget can have a big difference. If you're buying enough wool to make yourself a Norse underdress, you need a couple of meters. If you're buying that same wool, for example, to make a full late period German gown, I, when I do my Germans, start at eight meters for one of my gowns. And I go up from there, depending on what my sleeve looks like. So it's a serious thing. You need to look at what your sewing skills are. Now, I know lots of people have never sewn before, only sew for the SCA and do late period tutor. If you're up to that kind of a challenge, more power to you, please message me. I'll help you through whatever obstacles or nervous fits you tend to have. It's fantastic, but it is a serious consideration. I'd also rather you don't bite off more than you can chew. I want to see you achieve success with what you do do. And what's your favorite color? Um, a lot of times you can't wear your most outrageous favorite color, depending if you have a uniform at work or whatever you do in your real life. I find, I found out quite by accident, most of my garb is either green or purple in the SCA and I love it. So that's really a fun thing to do. Um, I've, whoops, hang on, my computer is being weird. There we go. So choosing, choosing your period can be a difficult one. Like when you're and we're not going to talk about persona because that's a different class, but the person you want to portray within the SCA, it can be difficult to figure out where you want to live, which is why I've posted that image for that 12th century gown. It's right sort of in the middle. It's accessible and it gives you something beautiful to wear while you're figuring out where you want to live. Um, we talked about the costs and everything. We talked about the sewing and your color. Now, I, if we go down here to fabric and color, that's my next slide. This slide is from Kiva. So I'm getting ahead of myself. So fabric when you're in period as well is usually hand woven. So you're talking about narrow 12 inches and up on how your width is. Unlike modern fabric where it's, you know, 60 inches wide, you've got very narrow fabric. So they use this process called re rectangular construction. I have a link in that to my resources, so I'm not gonna go into it. But what it does is it, it basically uses rectangles and triangles and put them together to get around the curves and to make outfits fit. So you can actually get a wonderful gown with a very conservative and minimal waist amount of fabric. The earlier periods do this, so it reflects back into your budget line. You can get your gorgeous gowns with rectangular construction with a small amount of fabric. It shifts a little bit when you get into late period, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Now I snapped these, snagged these pictures from Duchess Kiva, who is doing natural dyeing with local, Kiva, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's all indigenous plants here in the low, in North America, in BC, is that correct? I'm assuming so? Yes, yeah, I'm focusing on what can be uh, going on and harvesting in a more period way, if possible, yeah. Excellent. So for the purposes of intro to garb, I'm going to assume that you can probably replicate these colors in Europe just as easily as you can here in BC. The most exciting part of it, obviously, is the fact that there is my purple and there is my green. I'm just perfectly in, in play. So you don't have to think, oh, they're medieval. They all wore brown. They did wear brown. Of course they did. It's easy. If you got a brown sheep and you got a brown outfit, boom, you're done. However, you can have beautiful colors. You don't have to be dressed in the browns and the beiges if you choose not to. I've seen some beautiful work in brown and beige, they're gorgeous, but it is not 
a necessary thing. And I wanted to be really clear about that. That's why I chose this particular slide for that. Um, it's a thing. Now, when we do address, and this will address um, your fear of cutting into your good silk. There's three, in my opinion, there's three types of fabric that you can use while you're sewing. Good, better, best. The good one is how I started is a sheet. I love me some sheets. Now, a couple of things. You want to try to get a sheet that is cotton, not a polyester blend. I've got a link later on in our resource that tells you how you can burn fabric to test what its content is. So you'll have to look at that one and please don't set yourself on fire when you're doing that. The other thing I use sheets for is um, patterning. And I like to find sheets that have either straight lines or a grid because then you have your straight of grain and your weft marked on your sheeting. It's super cheap. I tend to shop at um, church thrift stores and um, those kind of thrift stores, whereas Value Village is a little overpriced now, for in my opinion. Um, so I try to haunt some of the smaller, the hospital thrift stores and the fundraising thrift stores for sheets. Fantastic. Um, when I was <clears throat> early on in my years, I also used broadcloth because when you, if we refer back to that picture that was up a little bit earlier where they have the counter colors as the facings and whatnot, broadcloth is a really wonderful bright color. It's relatively inexpensive. It doesn't run, it doesn't bleed into your other fabric. Now, broadcloth is a polyester fabric. Um, it is nasty to wear because it is hot and sweaty. It's also very stiff. It doesn't look proper. So use it as your trim. Be aware of what you're looking at when you're do using it. So that's just my word of caution on that. Um, sheeting is fantastic for some of your lighter dresses and it gives you a chance to not only draft your patterns, you can try them out for only $6, see if it works and fits you. And depending on if it's how sheer it is or not, and that's your call, you can wear it to an event. <laughs> Um, to stay warm, wool blankets, like the Hudson's Bay blankets, the wool blankets are fantastic. A lot of people swear by polar fleece, but I find it's cold, which seems counterintuitive. But if you yourself are warm, putting on polar fleece does not get you warmer. You need to put on wool. Um, I know people with allergies, you can do other fabrics. There's absolutely things out there, but a wool blanket is my go-to. And I, to this day, have a hard time walking by a beautiful wool blanket in a thrift store and not buying it. Do I, do I need it? No. Do I buy it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if anybody is really hard up for a wool blanket, you, I have some, it'll be okay. Um, so when you get into your sort of mid level of fabrics, which is a really good place to be, your cotton and your linen blends are really wonderful. Um, also your silk, if you don't have real silk, the sari shops will sell you silk fabric. Now be aware that anything that's shiny and drapey in those stores is often categorized as silk. So you have to refer back to your burn test to figure out what that is. Um, the other thing that's really wonderful and attainable in, in uh, sari shops is their turban cotton. So this chemise here is actually made of turban cotton. And to read it, you would probably be hard pressed to tell that this one is linen and this one is cotton. The only real huge difference I find is this one is way more comfortable to wear. It breathes and wicks better than the cotton does. The cotton is actually quite warm, but that's just something you can get to of your own accord. I have several, several of my under things and all my whites done out of turban cotton. We had them done for years. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't wear as well as linen, so you'll have to replace it sooner, but it does, it does the job and it's, um, Oh gosh, last time I bought turban cotton, it was $2 a yard. Now that's dating myself a little bit, but it's, it's a really accessible fabric. Your best fabrics to choose from, of course, are 100% natural. Linens, wools, silks. They date back entirely through our period. I had to look up silk because I wasn't 100% sure, but it goes around to 552 AD, I found out, um, which is lovely. The 
the wool um, blankets I mentioned earlier, Ikea has linen drapes. So if you're making some tea tunics and some gowns, Ikea has some fabric for you. Also, um, Yusk, some of their drapery is linen. So when you are in the thrift store, if you're going that way, you can check out the drapery section and sometimes find some beautiful fabric there for next to nothing. They also have cotton drapes that read the same way as their linen, which is the heavier fabric like this particular dress is made out of, which is nice. I did have a little infographic on burning here. There's a link on my resource page that actually shows you a little YouTube video and little images what you're looking for when you burn fabric. Um, it's got to do with how it melts and how it smells to tell if there's polyester and chemical in it. Now, at this point, before I get into patterns, my advice for your fabric is um, because you are putting time and effort into this, I would recommend that you um, buy the best fabric that you feel comfortable buying at this point, because odds are you're going to want to wear this outfit more than once, and you're going to want to be comfortable in it. Um, you also might not have cha a chance in once turning season opens to take the time to make another outfit to get to other events. So you may have to wear your same outfit a couple of times to a couple of different events and you want to be comfortable in it and you want to keep it. That green dress that I mentioned that was my very first one, I still have upstairs. It's lovely. It's still there. So does anybody have any questions at this point? I'm a little bit rambly and I can only see five of you on my screen. It's good. I'm going to assume we're good. Patterning. So what's really interesting and how I wanted to talk about this class being able to be garb that will fit any body is in period, we didn't use set patterns. Things were made for you and on you so that the the dress that necessarily the Norris dress that fits me is measured proportionally by measuring the circumference here just under my armpit dividing into the thirds and there's your panels. So the dress that's made for me will not fit my daughter who is you know a buck 20 soaking wet because her measurement is different it will also not fit my auntie who's you know, much more skookum lady because we measure around her and divide her into thirds. So it's a really approachable method, some of this garb. And it's absolutely fantastic because it doesn't matter how many, how many inches you have going on around, it's this many inches divided by three, doesn't matter. So it is a really, really wonderful thing. I do at this point go through how you can make this gown and I've done a little infographic. This is your seam line. In my case, I happen to find some fabric at the back wall that read properly. So I made it into a fold. But seriously, the seams on this are right here and right here. And they're left open from the purple stars. That's it. It's really not super tough. It does have a keyhole and neckline and I've included some links on how to do that neckline to get that um, opening for you, but it gives you a really princessy dress. Now, do you wanna be a, dressed as a man? Here's the same plan. We're not gonna give the man the floofy sleeves and we're gonna cut off the bottom of the skirting a little bit, but it's exactly the same method. This works for Norse, this works for like the 10th century Roman. This works for the early period R Rus, which is the, the Russians and things like that. They typically have it open in the center front, oops, center front and center back, as well as the sides, because then you can also ride a horse. But it's exactly the same method and exactly the same um, fabric and things like that. Easy peasy. I've included for you instructions that are here on a slightly different way to do this gown. This one has gores and it's inset, so it's a little more advanced and um, it's, it's really straightforward. Now, the other thing, if we're talking about this being your first event, and I know this seems weird, you gotta stay warm because there's nothing more miserable 
than being bloody cold at night because you're not going to have fun. You're not going to stay and you're not going to want to come back and it's just crap. So remember that wool blanket that we bought at the thrift store because we got it for $12? This coat is like nothing I've ever had. I am a late period German and Italian. This coat is an early period bog coat. They found extant coats in burials and things like that. I have always been cold. And I've always been a bit of a cranky nighttime camper until I made this coat. It's amazing. And literally, it's that simple. So the blanket has got two cuts here and one cut down the center. And it just folds in on itself. And there it is. It's wonderful. I can't recommend this coat enough. Like I honestly can't recommend it enough when, uh, when I can, and I have the blankets, I make them and give them to new people too. So I've done that. Also get yourself a hat. <laughs> it makes a world of difference. Keeping your head warm. Um, whether you're, if you have to wear a toque, that's fine. Wear a toque. I just want you to stay warm. This is a really straightforward, easy, fuzzy hat. It's great. There's a little tutorial link for you here and it's absolutely wonderful. Now, at least I'm going to move on to our page two. That's my son, by the way, repelling off a cliff. So I've given you a lot of information. Obviously, there's a lot of, lot of stuff, but I'm going to break some of it down for you. When I said that I would want it, I would like you to do the best job that you can, and we want you to be as most as historically accurate in an attempt. There's a couple of ways to break it down. A primary source that you're working from is if you decide you've seen an ex extant gown means um, the real thing. Like you've actually gone to a museum and you saw the gown. Boom. You can replicate that. A secondary source is because I went to the museum and write, wrote a book. You've read my book about it. Um, um, tertiary is somebody else who has written it and uses my book as a reference. It'll... It's not super critical at the moment, but it'll it'll make sense in a few minutes. Um, there are sorts all sorts of research papers out there for you to read, and with the advent of the internet, there's so much information available. It's just amazing. That being said, you also have to approach things with caution. I was lucky enough to take um, an art appreciation course in regards to this particular portrait. It was one of his main portraits. Um, what it boiled down to, and I'm, and I'm, I'm just going to have to roughly guess here. This is this brocade piece on her bosom here is not an accurate representation of the size of the pattern of the fabric. Is that? Did I say that right? Okay. Sorry, I don't think we're looking at the same thing as you because I know you need to reshare your page. Oh, do I? We still yes. see the hat. Stop share and yeah. reshare page two. Sure. Page two. Is that it? Did you see yes. the portrait? Yay! Yes. Thanks, guys. Okay, so there's no portraits beside this one. Okay, so this is the portrait I took a class on. So the pattern of the fabric in her bodice is giant compared to the pattern of the fabric in her gown. And what I can't even remember the man's name who I took the class from, so I feel bad. But what it came down to is historians feel that the portrait artist was sent a piece of the fabric. Here's a piece of the fabric. You're going to do a portrait for the gal. So he started painting and then she walked in one day and he went, oh, shit. And made the skirt and put her into his dress. The reason they know this is probably what he's done is they have the fabric still. The fabric exists. So use a, use some caution when you're looking at your portraits as well. Even though it's considered a primary source because it's a real portrait, it sometimes has some challenges within it. The other great resource is movies. I love period movies. However, 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 they're not all good. Um, my favorite period movies are the black and white Arrow Flynn's. I love them and Robin Hood and whatnot. Oh. So you have a Tudor lady with a pointy 1950s bra where she's supposed to be Tudor, which is flat, very fun. Or then you also have in the same room, like seven centuries of clothes. They're fantastic, I love them. So I've included a picture of Heath Ledger's A Knight's Tale, fabulous film. Please note, these two are dressed in a fantasy outfit. 
The people in the background, however, they're pretty good. So you've got to be cautious with Hollywood. Please be cautious. I have a whole page later in the handout that talks about film. And the rule of thumb is um, trust BBC. <laughs> Way more than North America. Okay, so now when we get to patterning, I said I would ad address patterning when um, we got there. And the early period patterning are done with folds. They're done with rectangular construction. And the later period patterning, even though it seems more daunting that you have something fitted, it's still made from your body. There is um, a method called bara tapes, and I'm sorry I didn't bring one down, but it's taken, a bara tape is made specifically for you. So they measure around you and then that piece of, I use grow grain ribbon, is then marked in half and it's marked in half again and it's broken down into I think 24 different measurement segments. And then when you use that measurement segment and it's magical that, you know, so this one will equal the slope of your shoulder and it's a, it's a tape that's taken from around your bust, but you break it all down into thirds and quarters and eighths and sixteenths and oh my god, that works. That's the measurement of your shoulder. So there's books about it. There's also pattern books. The first ones I've got on my screen are the Tudor Taylors, and they've done amazing work. Amazing. <laughs> this uh, modern maker is uh, Robert Gagne, and he's the one who does the class about period tapes. So for those of you who are sort of more of an intermediate sewer, there are modern patterns out there. Again, like the portraits and like the movies, there is an element of fantasy in your in your pattern. So please look at your pattern and see if you can find a portrait that matches it. This one is looking a little bit fantasy to me, whereas these two also by this, I think they're all simplicity, are far more accurate. So be aware and use caution if you're buying a modern pattern. Um, I've put these in here because they're challenging. That's the best phrase I can say. They're challenging. Please, if you're an inexperienced sewer or you're inexperienced with medieval clothes, do not go down this road. You will not enjoy it. It will be a bad day. That's all I'm gonna say. Uh, Berta has some really great patterns as well. This is German, which is very similar to the German that I wear, and it the look is right. Same with your tutor. The look is right. It's a great place to start. You pair that pattern with some correct fabrics, being natural fabrics and things like that, you'll be, you'll be doing really, really well. You don't want to sew it all? You can get pre-made garb. Fantastic. The internet has all sorts of pre-made garb. Again, check what you're looking at because there's also a lot of cosplayers, there's LARPers, there's fantasy groups out there. Everything is wonderful. This gown is really super fun, but if you start to analyze it and look at it a little bit, you got to wonder where her shoulder straps are. Also with a fitted sleeve like this, this looks maybe it's Venetian and Italian. Well, they didn't wear this long dangly princess sleeve. Um, so it's, it's really, it's really pretty. The golden green is gorgeous, but it's, it's not right. It's not historically accurate. Within our game, that's what we're aiming for is historically accurate gowns. So she is a little bit, and this, this gal, this uh, duchess that's here is the same dress that I've shown you earlier up in our handout, in our slides here. Same pattern, just different fabrics, which is wonderful. I have included in this giant handout for you guys, a reference sheet, and um, it's got all sorts of links to it. I also found out, honestly, I found out tonight, the rsca.org page has a resource page for beginners. It's amazing. It's amazing. So that being said, I wanna give you this. Oh, let me see if I can share the screen again. Hang on, I just made the wrong error. I don't think I can. In that handout of things is um, a paper doll pattern that Mistress Portia has done for us. And I have to see how I can re-screen re share again now that I've moved on. Hang on, new share, new share. 
there we go. I can't, it's not letting me share the paper dolls. Um, Portia drew for us paper dolls and they have um, all the different gowns that we're talking about and it's a beautiful resource. So that's basically my preamble, but then I've divided each page for you guys into our centuries. So in each page, because there's all those different documents, they include ideally a portrait um, in this case, I've got Roman pictures. This one has some pictures and some diagrams. Can you guys see this Roman page? Good. And then also some actual people. These two happen to be Byzantine, which is, you know, a little earlier as well as Greek and whatnot. So there are some amazing, amazing things out there. And here we go. And now this is my sixth, seventh century, which is basically where our SCA, our sixth century to 16th century starts. Is there anybody who has a specific era that they are interested in that I can speak to while I am right here? No? Then I'll just quickly go through some of these. Um, Desiree, someone posted 15th century Irish in the chat. Oh, hang on. Let me get there. I can, I, I don't know if I can do Irish, but I can get almost there. So just a sec. So this is 15th century. Share. So 15th century is when you're getting things a little bit more fitted. Um, I've got some historical notes so you can have a bit of a reference on here. So this is the time of Joan of Arc as well as um, the two princes were put in the tower in this point and Columbus hits North America well after Leif Erikson, I have to admit. So you've got your fun Hennens and things like that. Ireland is absolutely linked in with Scotland and England at this time. The only 15th century um, period gown that I know of personally is called a, a linea. I think I'm saying that right. And it includes um, a chemise that has outrageously full sleeves that is all gathered up. They're quite often yellow. They have a definite fitted gown that tends to be low and somewhat open in its doing up. I'm not as familiar with it and I don't know if I can specifically pull up the Irish. Mm. Yeah, no, I don't have it here. Um, if you message me directly, I have um, one of my protégés is very much about to cut into her wool to make that gown. I can find you the pattern for it. I just don't have it in here. I'm very sorry. I thought I did. Um, let me just move this over. The other thing that I have that's, no, I have Italian. I don't have anything super Irish. I did my I did um, sheets that I could split out for you when I got into the 16th century. So I'm I skipped that one. I'm gonna have to make a note of it though, and I'll add it. Um, when we talked about trade and things getting interesting after 1066 Normandy, in the last century, there's so many different things to cover. So I've got for you each a page in here. I've covered Germans, Italians, Tudors, things like that. Um, and Germany was really interesting because it wasn't yet known as Germany. It was several different smaller states. So Swabia was part of that and things. And um, this is where I normally live, obviously. And this is our little family of people that are here, which is wonderful. I um, have also made a chronic gown, which is a whole different piece of work from one of the artists and um, things like that. So we've got a lot of different things. What's neat about Germany at this time though, there's two different classes of people in Germany. We have patricians who are your nobles, your high merchants and things like that. So this is what we look like. And then you also have your lands connects, which are your soldiers for hire and things. And they dress a little bit differently and they're much more flamboyant. They do lots of colors. They do raiding. The cuts and slashes are supposed to, um, I've heard it said that when they, 
acquire new garb, they'll put it on and slash through it so you can see the other stuff that's underneath it because it's all very cool and they found all sorts of fun stuff. Um, so German is even fun when you see the color that's evident here as well as all the slashing. And if you come back up to us, we don't have that same level of slashing and it's a much more sedate, a dark palette and much more somber. So that's some of the fun things. The other thing I wanted to go into because it's just really cool are pirates. We did have pirates in period. Um, please do not use Pirates of the Caribbean as your reference movie. It's, it's out of period, um, but that's okay. They did have pirates. And what was really interesting about pirates in our era is they, um, they dress the same as everybody else. Uh, I, I do have Anne Bonny who's Irish, but um, I don't suggest you necessarily go to the SCA with your assets exposed like Anne Bonny has in this illustration. So use caution where <laughs> wearing that. Um, but they dress very similarly to regular people. Um, which is neat. So he's done up as a pirate. There it is. It's not the whole swashbuckling Johnny Depp kind of thing. Um, oh, look, I've referenced it. <laughs> um, some of some of Dizzy. So the reason I put this in here is some movies are really, really great. So early on in the film, even though this is not our period, you'll see her gown and her corset and everything, and she is actually dressed properly. As we get into the third film, we we meet Selma Hayek, whom I adore. However, she's got this weird gathered barmaid, busty, bosomy fantasy piece on. So it's, it's just a word of caution on film. You gotta be careful with what you're wearing. So. That being said, I have a note here on film as well. So let me pop this up. I've given you guys this reference. Um, Pinterest has a lot to offer as well as other Google searches. And I've included some of my favorite movies for referencing here. Shakespeare in Love was very, very well done. In fact, this exact photo I have blown up and pinned to my wall because it's an inspiration photo for garb that I sew for Godfrey. This look, this man is completely put together and everything is right. So it's a really, really great inspiration. Ala Triste is subtitled. So if you speak, I believe it's either French or Italian, I'm not sure. Um, great film. It's in period. The look is right. Now, granted, they're all in brown, but they are mercenaries. They're soldiers and they're fighting, but their garb is fantastic. And also they have some incredible hats. I don't have a picture for Barbarians here. It was the Netflix show Barbarians, where it's the Romans against the Germans in the in the um, Teutonic Forest? Teuton Teutonberg Forest. And um, while the lead characters are a little bit fantasy, much like in Vikings, the lead characters are a little bit fantasy. Um, it's really, really cool for the Romans. I wanted to touch on differences between BBC and Hollywood. Helen Mirren as Elizabeth is a BBC production, but we also have Gwyneth Paltrow as Elizabeth. Now, they're both good. Um, what set me off the very first time I watched the Gwyneth Paltrow one is they have a picture of her in her corset and it's heavily and lavishly embroidered. And I don't know that they can document that kind of embroidery on a piece of underwear that's just functional. That's a lot of hours. Um, I might be entirely wrong on this, but it just doesn't sit right with me. Uh, they also didn't use the actual coronation gown, which they have extant pieces of. So you need to be a little bit cautious. As we go down with the late period film, I love The Three Musketeers. It's really, really fun. You got to watch the corseting in this one because of course they have a little bit of a 1970s bra going on. Um, the 13th Warrior is an early period film for, for Norman outfits, wonderful. The other Boleyn girl is also really, really good. This this jacket is in the Tudor Taylor, which I showed you guys earlier, the pattern, and it's shockingly simple to put together. We already talked about A Knight's Tale, so I'm not gonna go into that one. 
The Tudors, this epic film. Um, where are their damn hats? That's what you got to look at with this one. And why is there, why are their jackets undone? And why is he sitting around looking like this? Because it's Hollywood and he's a, he's a hottie. You got to like that. But in period, this is not done. So you got to use it, take it with a little grain of salt and be a little bit cautious with what you're looking at. Does that make, does that make sense? I hope, please. Now, I wanted to go back to my Norse page because in there's Kiva. <laughs> um, in BC, it is wet and rainy and it can get damn chilly. So wearing your natural fibers and your wool can be very, very comfortable. This goes back to that same rectangular construction, the similar things. It's very approachable. It works no matter what size and shape you are. And it's really, really simple, really simple. And there's all sorts of instructions. This is a really basic Norse apron, um, as well as the underdress. So I've given you all sorts of links that are in here, as well as your math pattern. So when I go back to, you can fit any body in it. If you measure the circumference over your bust and under your armpits, divide it into three, this is the shape that you cut. And you get a gown, no matter what size or shape you are. Fun thing about Norse, festoons. So you can wear all sorts of beautiful, fun, beautiful jewelry. And this of course is uh, by Countess Gemma. And this is her new festoon. It's just lovely. It is the most approachable, even if it's not your dream era, it's really, really comfortable. And almost everybody I know has at least one Norse dress tucked away. Because if you need to do it in BC, you can put rubber boots under it. Thank you so much for listening tonight. Please feel free to message me if there's something I'm unclear or have been unclear about, or if there's more that you would like to look at. And I've included for you guys in my handout, a really awesome, I think it's awesome. You might, a really awesome resource guide that will, hang on, at least get you started down the road to research. Now my computer is loading, so it doesn't want to show it. New share. Hang on, there it goes. And hopefully, this will get you inspired. No, it's not responding. This will get you inspired to get out there and cut the fabric, do the thing, and make the dress or the tunic, as the case may be, and get yourself to an event when we open and we can meet everybody in person. Now, can we open it up and share it back? And is there anybody that has any questions or can I answer anything? Um, Desiree, do you want to stop sharing your screen? Yeah, I just don't know how. <laughs> oh, there you go. Oh, okay. I, got you. I can take you. I got you. There you go. Thanks guys. That was wonderful. Oh, thank you. I didn't realize that each of those pages was an entire view on a topic whether whether culture or or time period there's a lot of information there it's it's still very surfacey each page also has a link to the oxford reference page which is fantastic um you can go down the history holes that way and you can also google images i should have included that if you bring up the image on google and you put in sca seventh century garb it'll open up a whole window, both of actual drawings as well as photographs and things. So there's lots of lots of rabbit holes to go down. So what made you at the end of the day, out of all the periods, choose high German? This late, what was it about late German that appealed to you? I'm actually Italian. I know oh, Italian. that, <laughs> but I wear German. We wear high German. Um, okay. God Godfrey is high German. Okay. Um, it's just, it's so pretty. And the square neckline is quite flattering. And um, I like the bands of fabric that are around it and whatnot. And also, I know I'm not wearing them, but the ridiculous hats. 
like I'm all about a ridiculous hat with the outrageous feathers. Um, I have one in particular where the feathers curve up in the back. And so when I stand in front of Godfrey and look around the room, it gets him right in the face. It's fantastic. It's a lovely <laughs> Well, does anyone have, have any questions? Oh, I, I just had a comment. I was going to say, yay, fancy hats. I love big hats. <laughs> yeah, and Germans have the biggest and fanciest hats, aside from the Princess Henan. But that one's very uncomfortable to wear, I just have to tell you. Yeah, that's why I made mine truncated. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. But you can't my... beat a German hat. Um, um, I've enjoyed doing some of the Italian uh, calls. The, you know, the... The, the bag sort of idea of, <laughs> of gathering with a band in the front. Mm -hmm. I've done a couple of those that uh, they're quite comfortable to wear. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You mentioned you had uh, information about keyhole necklines. Yes, it should be on the resource page. Um, if it isn't there, I can't say so I wrote it two weeks ago. <laughs> if it isn't there, um, I'm just trying to Google it right now and see if I can send you a link directly. Um, they are, they're shockingly easy to do. They um, really are. Yeah, yeah, they really are. But you should be able to find a YouTube video for it. No, I'm just getting things for sale. I need to go onto YouTube. <laughs> um, I would recommend that you Google it in YouTube. Okay. To start, or you can also in your Google Images, <clears throat> in your Google Images, put SCA keyhole neckline, and you will get um, um, images and pictures, and you can you can track down the the path and get yourself to a YouTube video. Okay. I'm gonna have to write that down. Linea and keyhole necklines. I don't think I actually included the instructions in there. <laughs> I think one of the things that we haven't really covered um, and that people, women in particular, is that how often our hair would not show. Mm -hmm. Bridget caps or something else covering your hair, which is great when you're camping. Oh, it's fantastic. I'm going to write that down too. Um, yeah, I'm all about, I'm all about the hats. Yeah. Oh, that's not my book. How does linen drape and wear compared to wool? Because I know the originals were mostly all in wool, but I'm an OCR and off survival. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you can use you can use heavy cotton and heavy lemon linens in place of wool. This particular dress, this really heavy solid, is linen actually. Okay. It's, it's just a solid heavy weight, and it would have it would have been um, in use through the generations. Linen, of course, dates back to Egypt and then some. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I know, know cotton is fairly ancient in Egypt, but you when know, I get to Europe before 1066. Yeah, I don't I don't know if they use it as much um, because you have to be a hot and dry to, to grow it, whereas linen grows in a swamp. Um, yep. so, yeah, and it's also more durable. Like I've had to actually throw out underdresses of cotton because they've ripped and torn and worn through. Whereas linen just gets more comfortable the more you wash it. Well, you don't really need a dry climate for cotton either. You need you need a you need some humidity. It can't grow in West Texas, but it can grow in East Texas. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> Ooh, another note about your fabric, I should also add, um, wash it and put it in the dryer before you sew and cut it. Mm -hmm. Um, no matter what it is, I wash my wools too, and I put them in the dryer. The kicker with your fabric when you're doing that, set your timer for every 15 minutes and clean your lint tray. You do not want a dryer fire. Clean your lint tray. Especially and silk. Then, yes, absolutely. Silk. Clean your lint tray. And then once your garment is made up, I still machine wash all my garb, but I hang everything yeah. to dry. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to write that down too. Some things that I have been discovering in learning about uh, creating cloth from fibers. So uh, it isn't just about the sizing that commercial uh, companies put on the fabric. Um, linen, so from flax, uh, when you spin it, uh, actually, you actually need to, um, before you go to uh, before you go, go to actually weave it, 
you need to actually boil it and scour it. It tightens up the fibers and so that your weave is much more even. And so, and then that still needs to be done after the fabric has then also been woven, just to tighten it up and make it a little bit more smooth and a little more even and soften it up a little bit. Oh, it's cool. really important. And then by that time, your, your seams should stay in alignment, hopefully. <laughs> and if you're mixing fibers like silk and linen or something, um, make sure that there's a, this is where your pre-washing is really important because they will shrink differently. Mm -hmm. And then it's something, I'm going to say it because it is my geek. Um, that, so out of the bogs, uh, the Museum of Denmark discovered that some of those fabrics were not linen. Oh, wow. They were nettle cloth from Scandinavia. Cool. They've done the DNA testing. They've done the microscopic. They know that for a fact. And, but the nice thing is that linen and nettle have very similar structures as plants and act much the same. There's cool. very, very little difference in how they're created. Well, that's interesting. Fiber is not my personal walk. So that's really interesting. Uh, um, just a, a note on, on silk too. I, even after I pre-wash, I still allow an extra 5% in the cutting. <laughs> it's not a bad plan. Um, and and silk will silk will silk will also shrink a second time oh, and a third time. Oh, okay. Oh, this is important to me because my my sir my side of the coat is my eventual one is uh, going to be silk. In fact, is I have a silk lining fabric, so in that that nice nice um, smooth silk, and then I have a a thicker silk. Um, to look at it, you would almost think it was wool or a thick linen, but it is definitely silk. When you feel it, you know it, it and I've done a little bit of burn test on it. They are actually silk. They're just different um, weaves, different spin and different weaves. Does, they, does that also affect it? Well, Curtis put my undergown through the dryer before I'd beaten it into him that all our garb gets hung. Um, and even yet, and yet the third time when I when it got washed, it went into the washer and I hung it to dry and it still shrunk. So I was not a happy camper. That was the undergown I made for Melissa's wedding. And I then had to hand it down to my daughter. Oh, well, at least it's still in use. Silver lining. I, I don't know if she's wearing it anymore. Oh, that was, with her, her as a as a teen, right? She's not a teen anymore. Two of us are. They got. <laughs> nope. It's cool. I could probably do like a whole thing just on um, fibers and textiles and what they're for and how to use them and why they do what they do and don't do what they want them to do. There's so, there's so many offshoots. I had a hard time even compiling these pages because I'm like, what do I include? What do I not include? What do I include? Oh no narrow stay focused <laughs> oh yeah overviews are yeah. totally the hardest thing to do yes <laughs> it's so easy yeah. to go down rabbit holes it, it really is it really is but i did learn about the silk they, that they can document back so that was really interesting to me and um some of the other stuff was really really cool i learned a little bit more about some of the early period history that i wasn't aware of i knew leif erickson had come to newfoundland well before columbus but they didn't know how long and it was substantial so stuff like that. It was really, really interesting. So please go read the Oxford reference pages. It's amazing stuff. And it's all in little tiny um, edible bite-sized points because I have the attention span of a gnat. So it was grand. It was grand. It was really great. Oh, another tip I can share with you guys because uh, an underdress or a chemise or a shirt looks the same, be it male or female. What we do in our household is anything that has a little embroidered green hem is mine. 
whereas the ones without the little bit of green embroidery are his. And that way, the reason I discovered this is because I turned around one morning in a camp thinking, where the heck is my shirt? I cannot go out without an underdress. And it's like, oh, on your little hot body. Thank you very much. <laughs> so there's more than one of you in the tent. It's just a learning curve. Yeah. If I could uh, share a little bit of my own experience. I you know, wrote my persona history and chose my period and everything when I was just a few years into the society and then realized that my dream period doesn't look good on short people. Oh no. <laughs> it looks good. It looks really good on women who are five eight and taller. And that's that's the you know the Cote RD and, and sideless surcoat, you know, yeah, heraldic. I, yeah. I think anybody can wear it. I think um well not after children. I might have been able to wear it before children, but yeah, I, I went to earlier period after that. It just felt better. You know, and it's all about comfort because the thing is you're supposed to have fun, damn it. It's supposed to be a game. We're supposed to be enjoying ourselves. So don't get yourself trussed up in something late period and Venetian unless that's really what you want. And let's place it, a lot of the of the generic undergowns can can go over what five, six centuries. Oh yeah. Just vary what's on top. And 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 also it's you know, limiting yourself to just one period is not much fun either. And my really I have now got warm German things, a warm German coat and a warm German hat. Um, I stole the coat from a friend and the hat was given to me from another friend and one thing and another, but let me tell you my early period fuzzy hat and my bog coat, glorious. Cause you need to be warm, you need to be comfortable. I should also make a note about under things being predominantly white. In my 30 odd years of looking at portraiture, I've only ever seen one black undershirt and I've never seen it since. So it would be white or natural or cream or beige and things like that. Typically. I think that's, I think that's one thing we don't always do a good job of in the SCA because we go to the fabric store and it's as easy to get white as it is to get blue, as it is to get red when we're looking at our linens or pink. So like, why not pick a color with our modern eyes than to always pick natural. But I do think an outfit, like let's say, you know, I do Viking age or early period stuff. It always looks better with a natural layer. Like it's just a greater silhouette if you can layer with a colorful outer layer. So I do the, I do now much more than I used to try. I'm wearing right, right, white right now. Um, try to get more natural uh, base layer because it is more period and it does ultimately get, get you, like you, you look better in it, I, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's easier to wash and keep clean. Yeah. Which I think is why originally, well, just it's practical. Why are undershirts today still white? You know, you can bleach them if they get really dirty. Absolutely. Or lay them in the sun and let the sun bleach them. Desiree, do you have any advice for buying fabrics online? Do you get yours online or do you? I think you, I, you touched I on am, it earlier. I am really tactile. I have not yeah on my resource page, um, fabricstore.com, which has always been tried and true for your linens and things like that. And Overseas Fabric now has an online presence and they oh. know who we are in the SCA and will not steer you wrong. So that's something local. And Gallup Fabrics, I think does online and ships, but I'm not hundred percent sure. The only one that I can absolutely stand behind is fabricstore.com. Oh. Um, me, I'm a very, I'm a very touchy feely. I need to, yeah. yeah, there is a there is a Canadian source for linen. Um, the price is a little bit better than fabricstore.com and it's pure linen envy, but they don't yeah. have as big a, uh, a range of colors. Yeah, as can you, fabric can you get store swatches com. from them. Yes. Yeah, I have a pile of swatches from them. The colors are fantastic. Well, what's what's the name again? It's pure. What was it? Linen, linen envy. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, overseas fabric is just in Abbotsford and they're doing, they're working really hard a lot with, a lot with Portia, cause she lives right there about 
are these colors good? Is this weight right? And things like that. So we're working directly with them so that they can bring in the stocks of the linens and the things that we in the SCA typically look for. So overseas is fantastic resource for us here on the mainland. Yeah. Um, there's also a Atex fabric downtown. I put that in the link and things like that. So there's lots of sources if you're if you're a touchy feely gal. Speaking of Atex fabric downtown, that's where we I, I'm in I'm based in Vancouver in Lionsgate here. Um, if you mention you're in the SA, he often gives I think a 10 or 15 percent discount. You really, and then he try, also tries to get stuff in for us. So I I do try to support that. Um, mm -hmm. That's yeah. So it's always worth mentioning to him that, and he also he's also comes out to our events when we yeah. have them too so yeah and it, and they'll also show you extra fabric that you may not see oh you should look at this which is always a hazardous um thing. <laughs> problem do any of them have the shot silk um uh, the like the veiling uh no i've never seen that oh uh, because i know i was able i was always able to get it at uh, fabricana but their supplier is not supplying it anymore. Oh no. Hmm. If anybody what? sees a source for that, I am very interested. You might try contacting Rocco Saris. They're sort of uh, East mm. Van. They might have or be able to tell you where you can get some. They always have some really interesting silks and things. Yeah. They do a lot of bridal outfits wonder if overseas fabrics would uh, because i have picked up some silk there from them um some of the lighter silk and that's in abbotsford it's worth asking him he's really really great i might have to trek out to abbotsford that's that's closer actually than east van is that these days <laughs> and also i was at uh, fabric land on marine drive very recently just uh, like a few days ago and they have pure linens in they are 50 dollars a meter Ooh. oh so it's that's literally uh doubled their usual pure price linen nv.ca as you've suggested is about 13 dollars a meter versus yeah. 50. yeah and for listening. pure linen envy if you order comes to 200 bucks you get shipping for free oh Eighty no, dollars! Hooray! I would, I would suspect that the fifty dollar is actual European linen as opposed to Chinese linen, and the Chinese linen is called. They have a technique called cottonizing, which chops the fibers up and treats it like cotton, and it doesn't last the same. I've touched the stuff at the fabric land that they're charging over fifty dollars for. And uh -huh. it doesn't feel any different. It's not any smoother or any more fine. Okay. This seems standard. Like I was, I, I looked at it and went, not in your life. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. double what they used to charge. Yeah. I think that's COVID hitting us. Yeah. And if you're putting in an order online, put it out in the, in the Facebook world and you can get a bulk order together really quite easily. Class over? Absolutely. 